Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very special 10th edition of the Ramshala International Film Festival. And I'm Deepti, the festival manager. Um, at DIFF, we always curate films and especially documentaries that address the most crucial events and movements of our time. So we're really happy to be able to host this conversation today. I think it's timely and important for us to collectively discuss the strategies and choices that filmmakers make in documenting these times. So uh, to lead this conversation, we have Vedatri Chaudhary, who is a culture journalist and a documentary film professional. She is also the managing editor of Documentary Magazine and a programmer at Doc NYC. Uh, over to you, Vedatri. Thank you so much, Deepthi. And uh, you know, I, I really wish we were all in the same room having this conversation, but this also allows us to convene and meet across uh, different time zones uh, and different countries. So I'm very glad to be having this conversation. So I'll do a quick go around the room asking, uh, you know, these amazing people I'm speaking to today to introduce themselves and uh, maybe just speak a little bit about uh, their careers and their film. Anam, I know, has a film in the festival, so it would be great if I could start with Anam, then Tuba, then Rintu and Sushmit and have them introduce themselves. Anam. I forgot to unmute myself. Hi, thank you for having us. I'm really excited to be with this group of people. Uh, my name is Anam Abbas. I'm a Pakistani filmmaker, producer, director. Um, my film, This Stained Dawn, is playing at Taramshala. Uh, it's also called, the Urdu title is Daak Dawajala, and it follows the Women's March, uh, Aurat March here in Pakistan um, to the lens of a few characters based in Karachi. Uh, previously, I've made Showgirls of Pakistan. I produced and shot that film. Uh, you can see it on YouTube. It was released via Vice. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and excited about this talk. Hi, um, and thank you. My name is Tiba, and I'm not a filmmaker. Uh, I'm an organizer, a feminist organizer who works in Pakistan, and I'm closely associated with the Oyat March in Islam. Hi, um, my name is Rintu Thomas and what a lovely group of people to be sharing space with, I have different histories with, with uh, most people and uh, I'm an in independent documentary filmmaker based in India. Um, Sushmit and I, we studied together in film school and after that uh, started our own non-fiction film company called Black Ticket Films and for the past 11 years have been making um, a lot of uh, interesting, meaningful nonfiction cinema in the country. And um, we recently created our own first uh, feature documentary. It's called Writing with Fire. It's right now uh, traveling festivals around the world. And, and here we are doing our first in-person in the US as the film premieres at Doc NYC. I think, hi, my name is Sushmit. Rintu's pretty much summed everything up, except that it's not 11, it's been 12 years. That we've been doing. My this. math has always been so. Yeah. Suspect. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, you know, I'm I'm very excited to have this conversation. So let's first start talking about Anam uh, Rintu Sushmit, and then I'll go to you, Tuba. That you know, within your filmmaking careers, how have you decided to make a film? on a particular subject like what appeals to you what what is that thing that jumps out to you and says okay i need to make a film about this anam do you want to go first sure um i think it's quite random it's never the same uh the first short i made in pakistan was uh called Lucky Irani Circus and it was about the longest running circus in pakistan and literally somebody else said i was like I was in my early 20s and I was like, I just left film school and I was like, what should I do with my life? My mom wants me to get married. And it's like older actor uh, who's really famous here. I was happening to, I happened to be around her and she said, just go make a film about a circus. And I always wanted to join the circus as, as I was a kid. So I was fulfilling that. And then with Showgirls of Pakistan, which took seven years to make, uh, the director Saad Khan brought the project to me and it really appealed to me because I was interested in like exploring what it's like to be a woman and women who dance uh, in dance halls on the Punjabi stage that really, it was an opportunity to look at Pakistani society from the complete margins. 
And then with this, with this Dane Dawn, I think after struggling so much with this film, that was really not my community. It was a community that I had to earn access to, to make a film about my friends, my community, people I've known, experiences I've had was uh, in, a, in one way a relief, but also something that, that needed to be done to, for me to, to grow as a filmmaker, to understand after seven years of introspecting with showgirls, like, why am I making this film? How do we represent this community that's not us in a fair way, in a collaborative way? And it took a while, it took a while to like, move from this Western um, mindset that we've been trained in to like, okay, well, what do we want to be as filmmakers? Um, yeah, so it's it's been a journey. <laughs> so Shmeta, I'm going to. Um, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we driven automatically story, to stories of hope and, and in hope there is always resistance. Um, when I look back now at all the independent work that we've done, resistance and protest culture has weirdly been embedded in it. And we were not always consciously following that track. Um, so when we were just out of film school back in 2009, 2010 is when we started Black Ticket Films. And there was no work. Like everyone said, your ideas are great, but you're too young. Like, you know, who's the boss in the company? And he was like, it's us. Um, so we lost all of those projects at almost like the final stages. And so we dived into sort of continuing our indie work. And one of the first shorts that we made was this, you know, Jan Tiersen track uh, from Amelie for this um, NGO uh, that works with children living on the streets. And uh, with this very basic camera shot at night, and uh, that film ended up sort of uh, raising a lot of resources for them. And then the next one that was a more ambitious and serious and concerted effort was a film on two refugee families living in Delhi, one Burmese, one Afghan, um, called In Search of My Home. And after the, f and this was like the pre Facebook slash Twitter era. So the idea was how do you get people to watch, watch an indie film? And we, so we sort of like wrote mails to friends across the world. And we were like, we'll give you like a seat. And that was pre DVD days. So we'll give you a CD, we'll ship you a CD of the film. Can you, can you screen it on uh, World Refugee Day in your communities, wherever you are? And so strangely, when you look back now, uh, this, was, this was 2010. Uh, the film played in over 20 countries, uh, from a theater in Singapore to high school in um, Canada, uh, to uh, uh, an office in Kenya and, and the entire spectrum. And we were able to raise resources, but more importantly, uh, create sort of like a amplified sort of pressure structure on the UNHCR in India which eventually resulted in uh, the Burmese refugee family getting their refugee certification. And that's when we were like, it works. Like, you know, uh, uh, impact is always linked to, you know, our storytelling. Again, not consciously, we don't make films to create impact, but we do realize that if the, if, if the stories that you're telling are profoundly going to affect your audiences, things will move. And I think that's essentially been the journey that we've had uh, over the past few years, also with the choice of stories that we've taken up, not only with our independent body of work, but also commissioned work. Uh, we've been lucky. No, and that is where, you know, Sushmit, you literally walked into the next question where I bring Tuba in is both Anam and Sushmit and Rintu, you guys are kind of blurring the lines between, I don't think there ever existed a line, but you know, in the in people's perception, there's a binary between filmmaking and organizing. And you guys have, I mean, from what I've seen of your work, you guys have always used your films to organize. And Tuba, I'd like to ask you as an organizer of the Aurat March, which Anam's film centers around, 
is did you ever i mean i would like to like you to talk a little bit about your relationship with filmmaking i know you said you're not a filmmaker and neither am i thank god uh, but uh, <laughs> i mean i i would make a very bad uh, film if i had to make one but just to uh, just you know your relationship as an organizer with filmmaking how you viewed it and if that has changed after your collaboration with anam or you know even i'm sorry i i let you talk uh, in 2 seconds but were you very in the ways in which the mainstream media has depicted you and your movement were you wary of a filmmaking team coming in and working with you i mean um i feel like as organizers of something such as aurat azadi march which is you know if you know about it in a in in a country like pakistan which is largely conservative um and you know holds certain values when it comes to women and women's representations and we know this is very common you know across south asia that we live in nation states which you know which idolize certain kind of ideal women in our country so i feel uh, same same as what is happening in pakistan and what filmmakers like anam can do is i like fill those missing archives fill those archival gaps in which what what really happens is once we march and we organize what people really look at is the show we put on or the you know the happy faces or the women uh, and obviously mainstream media always focuses on a certain kind of urban educated feminist woman and it never really shows you what what goes on behind uh, that day and how how that day actually takes place i think what what anam really did for us was kind of like fill that archival gap of what really goes into that organizing and how that shows that people see and the women they see how they come together and the kind of work that goes on uh, behind it because what we really what happens in mainstream media is that it only focuses on the day and what happens on the day and the, you know and kind of like sensationalizing it and taking out everything which can potentially become controversial so i think uh, what anam does is really highlight the the intensive labor which goes into producing uh, anything and i think uh, it it was a way of like combining various forms of creative labor for me when i see anam doing this kind of work because there's one creative labor that we do and for me organizing has been a science but it's more of an art um you have to continuously recreate the ways you're doing things how are you collectivizing people how do you represent the movement uh what images and visuals you want to prioritize and i think uh anam's film really did help us in 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 the sense that um if we leave it to the society or the state uh and how it is especially towards this particular movement i think uh we would have been completely invisibilized our labor is invisibilized because the focus is just on what went wrong um ye aur kitni fahash hai you know how vulgar are these slogans so i think that becomes the very center of the movement um and i think what what films like these do is really bring to life um the work and labor of those women who are involved in this movement and also humanize them because in our society when you're a bad woman sadly that's the only thing you are but the labor of those bad women uh, in bringing this together is never accounted for and i think i'm I'm definitely thankful for what Anam did for us and for the movement. So yeah. Sorry, two years into this, I still don't know when to unmute myself. Sorry, guys. Uh, just reminding the audience uh, that you know, as the conversation progresses, you can use the Q and A function to type in your questions. We will be getting to them towards the end of the conversation. Um, Tuba, thank you so much. And in fact, I'll come back to you and then go through Anam Sushmitandran too again. You know, so much of it is collaborative. and even sushmita and rintu's uh, film and they've and i've known them for a bit their films have always been about community and people coming together and the immense power in people coming together and you know the changes that brings uh, you know that comes with that but i have a question to uh, that you know when so much about it is about the collective and the collective organizing and people coming together and you as an organizer what happens or how how do you deal with and you know it is a film at the end of the day it's a 90 minutes narrative and it has to be character driven where 
three out of 35 faces will get more screen time or will get talked about more. You know, you become the face of the movement, you become the face of the film. So what, how do you negotiate with that? And, you know, I'll come back to the filmmakers and ask them how they make these decisions, but I want to hear from you first. I think it's it's inevitable. It's inevitable in, in anything collective you're doing. Um, in the end, we do end up requiring faces. I mean, for example, when I was organizing in Asamba, there were many women organizing with me, but for some reason, I did end up becoming the face of it in Asamba. And that's that's very difficult for you as an organizer to cope up with too, because that's not what you want the movement to become or to represent. But at the same time, I also recognize the power you have as someone who becomes the face of that movement. Um, and I, I, I do feel like it's, it's almost impossible uh, for a movement to represent, to be represented without those faces, because in the end, you know, somebody will be called to speak on TV somebody will be filmed, somebody will be giving interviews. So I, I, I do feel that it's, it's obviously it's very, it's very difficult, even when you are becoming the face yourself. And I, I'm not the face in this film, and I'm sure the organizers who are feel very similarly about this. Um, it's, not a, it's not a comfortable position to be in, but I also realize it's important. It's critically critical importance because in the end, those three, four faces do represent what I, I go through or how I organize and how women in other cities were organizing. So I think that becomes really important too because um, while recognizing and sitting with our discomfort, we also realize the importance of it. And we also realize the need for it. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's not just that Anam's film was important for Anam to make, or you know, uh, for Sushmet or Rintu to make those films. It's also important for those communities because I feel like some these films eventually end up becoming um, kind of like a weapon of the oppressed. Um, and I, I, I do feel like, and not just a weapon, but also more like a tool kit which provides education and perhaps like consciousness, it adds to that. It also makes history. It also brings alive the history which will never otherwise perhaps be written. Because um, all these details are you know, often left out when, when you're writing something down. So I also feel like that while it, it might be uncomfortable for both the filmmakers and the people who are in, in these films, it's also very, very important and critical work. And this is the only way to bring it forth. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Anam, Sushmit, and Rindu, the other side of the question is a more process-oriented question. How do these three faces, and I'm just like, you know, dropping these numbers, how do these X amount of faces from like a sea of people who are running these movements, how do they appeal to you? How do you decide? And I'm not saying spotlight, but how do you decide to have them as the pillars of your narrative? Anam, if you can go first. So I think that this multi-character documentary feature is, is a formula we've seen a lot. And sometimes I question that, like, do we need that? But it, it's, it's helpful, especially with stories like these, because they are so layered and you're supposed to, you know, especially as independent filmmakers working, we, we have to have an international audience, an international marketplace, international funding, because there's no other way to survive unless you're, you know, independently wealthy and, and can pour that into your films, right? This is years of labor. And so, you know, you're, you're tasked to put so much context, information and humanity and a story arc and character development and, you know, empathy and all these and, and comedy and all these things into 90 minutes. And so I think you need different faces. Um, but then you know, what Tuba was saying about who becomes those faces, I mean, in these movements, whether it's Khabar Lariya or, or, or at March, it's, you know, they're frontline workers who uh you get spotlight, but you're also, that also brings a lot of danger, right? Whether you're a Dalit woman or a feminist organizer, if you're the face of anything, that's, uh, it's not like you're being favored, you're a frontline worker in this jung. And so, I, you know, for me, choosing the characters for or, for, for the Oyat March film, that was important to see what, it, what it's like to be on the front lines, um, but also, you know, in, in the in the circle, like, what does it mean to be a young woman coming into this march? Like, what is my perspective? What is it? What does it mean to be not so into the march and just being sort of like around the scene? 
and like uh, Tuba said, because there is this narrative that's uh, propagated from the top to uh, the masses in Pakistan about what kind of woman it is who asks for Mira Jasmine Mirzi, for me, it was very important to like to scatter that narrative and bring nuance and, and diversity and show the different perspectives. But also like filmmakers are also human beings. For me, access is really important. Like I, I think about how I made this film, you know, I was not making very much money. I had like a lower back injury. I was very tired. It was a difficult process. And I was like, who do I have access to already? Like who are people that I've known for a while? They're my friends and I don't have to like fight for this. And they'll just be like, ha ha, karlo. So, I mean, that's also like, that goes into it as well. Like how much, like how much, can you give and who's going to give back to you? Because it is, again, if it's a collaboration, who's giving back to you and embracing the process? So for this film especially, and I think every film, that, that really matters as well. Sorry, like we're the three same page. <laughs> Um, I think I'll just add add to that. Like a lot of it is what Anam said, and uh, it's it's part of it is intuition, and part of it is the technical aspect of making a film, um, and and in in it it's just you naturally in a room of people. It's just like walking into a room where you know nobody, and who are you going to have a conversation with? How many people would you carry back? Uh, when you leave the room and and it's really that who's most comfortable with uh, with your energy and and uh, reflects that back um and from a technical point of view who can actually be comfortable in front of the camera because that's so important uh, who really wants to tell their story um and will not uh, consciously keep looking, uh, uh, you know, about where the camera is, who can lose awareness of, of the mic. Um, and that is also, you know, you, you figure that out very slowly, but also very quickly. It's, it's just a very human thing. The articulation of that story is going to be entirely based on that person. So that choice becomes very critical. And I think something that both of us really get attracted to is the lightness of being. Because a lot of times the stories that we're saying telling are about serious things. And you and you can you're mostly entering realities that are not yours. Uh, and that's the inherent nature of, of filmmaking, especially in nonfiction filmmaking. Um, there is an unequal balance of power. Um, and we acknowledge that upfront. And create a space where people can have that conversation with us and for when people are doing really um, hardcore work how can I present that story which is in an accessible way in an entertaining way and for that their lightness of being is is super critical I think that's really how we cast people you know, I, I remember reading somewhere about this, that there's a, a difference in story and plot, like, you know, especially with the films you make and Tuba, you know, there's, you know, with with organizing, the thing that comes is you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the plot, but you know the story of it. You know what's going to happen, you know, you know how it's going to unfold, but you don't know the details of it and which is where you know it goes back to like documentary filmmaking as a as a mean as a way of journalism or like finding intersections of journalism how do you each of you and Tuba the question for you would be you know it's an ongoing process and what I love about both your films is it does they don't end with a finite end it just it they don't even end like you know because it's not I mean not, not neither of your movements have ended and the whole point is that that it's going on and I love that both the films end on that but I would like to uh, a little bit from you and then the filmmakers is you know when when it's an ongoing thing when you don't know the plot and like you and like you know you didn't know the cops are gonna come you didn't know those I mean you probably had an idea but you didn't know what they would say and so what you know, there is that uncertainty that filmmakers are probably used to working with. So how did you navigate or negotiate with that? That, you know, being present while not knowing what is to come? Um, I think um, I've been organizing for over 10 years. I mean, Aurat March happened in 2018, but 
my organizing with the working class community communities across Pakistan started way back when I was a student. Um, and I think it's, to me, it's, it's just a very basic core principle of organizing that the struggle goes on, the struggle continues, right? Um, and, and, and that's what it is because it doesn't, no movement can start with just some people and end with them too. Uh, and, and that is the thing about resistance, especially in the kind of world we inhabit. Um, it's never ending. We all know that there are multitudes of struggles, there are layers of oppression, there, there's also layers of resistance. And I think that's what it is. And I'm um, Anam's, um, as far as I remember, Anam's film ended um, at this protest, which was, um, you know, which was an anti rape protest or when, when a rape of a woman happens on motorway. Um, and and that, was, that, that was something which really shook up the country. But it also showed in a way that how so many women who were coming and protesting and were almost always dismissed by the state and the society alike, yet despite that movement going on and people rejecting and dismissing what we were saying, the violence against women and the patriarchy still thrived in the country. It still kept going. Um, it was never ending. So I think in a way it, it also tells you the story of organizing, the story of resistance, that it, it just, it's never ending. Um, unless there's a revolution of that sort. And we, you know, we are in a utopia, which, which doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. So I do feel like that anybody who's organizing do, does acknowledge that this organizing will perhaps never end. And this, this struggle just goes on. And you, you do your part, whatever you're able to do. And I think um, that's, what, that's a very basic understanding that you come into organizing with. It, unlike a job, you know there are no promotions, you know there are no acknowledgements. Um, and you know that it's, it's, you, you're just going to have to keep going till the time you can. And sometimes even when you know you can't, you'll have to keep going. And I think um, that's an understanding with which more pe most people do resistance politics. Yeah. yeah, and let me tweak that question a little bit for the filmmakers. You know, the... And both and you know both the filmmaking teams you're kind of resisting that idea of film as a finite document that you know you, you know the way we talk about documentaries you know have you seen the documentary on Aurat March have you seen the documentary on Kabbalaria where whereas the conversation is never singular that you know there is never the documentary it's always like you know there's a documentary and then there are documentaries after that so how and I know both of you are resisting that finite idea within documentary storytelling. So my question for you would be how and it's again a process driven question is that how, how do you set yourself up to film something that you know will change or like you know that is ongoing and then how do how do you I mean I think the question I'm trying to ask is how do you know where to stop filming and know that this is where my film ends. Sushma, do you, Sushma and Rintu, if do you want to go first? Yeah, that's a that's like the chicken and egg question. When do you stop? You know, there was this one time when someone was sitting opposite us, and it's like, when do you stop? And in this moment of epiphany, Rintu went, when we have a story, and and it's like, oh yeah, that's a good answer. But well, but so for instance, with I, I think just just for context. <clears throat> With Writing With Fire, it was our first film where we were actively um, filming in an observational style, so to speak, where things were happening on the ground that we had no control over. All the other shots that we had done before this were about events that had happened a decade before, a few years before, or, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And then you're finding creative ways of presenting um, that story to the world. And uh, I, I think how, how we sort of dived into this one was, this is the story of a newspaper. And what intrigued us was after 14 years of print, they're shifting to digital, what's going to happen? I mean, that was a natural sort of like buy-in. Uh, we landed up in Uttar Pradesh and incidentally, you know, the, the first day that we met Meera and her team, was the day that they, Mira was making the pitch. digital shift And in that room of about 23 women, it was very charged. Uh, we found our characters right there. Like, 
you know the film has three characters and 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 um and then as over the course of this one year that we filmed them in 20 between 2016 2017 we in a sense had the arc of the newspaper like you know uh, whether it would be successful or not uh, but what we began then searching for was what is the journey of these women you know and 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 it it i mean personally like just just from 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 my own point of view on this like, i think that um ideas of a mother's guilt or a woman's guilt in a family i never talked about in our homes you know uh the choices that women have to make between their career or taking care of their family i mean they're always caregivers in a home but those same services in an industry usually mostly are manned by men and it becomes a transaction but the assumption is inside the home the nurturer is always and 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 this is information that is sort of like you grow up with it you never challenge it so so similarly playing out i mean uh, the role of a woman within the home then within the community then within the industry or like you know or, or as a possibility of a leader of a nation state is never essentially talked about right because you've always got to be a caregiver and and along come these journalists in khabar leheria who are really flipping the narrative of what dalit women can do you know and and popular media of course projects them in a certain kind of a way uh, uh, dalit women always need to be victimized or there will be these you know exceptional cases where they are superheroes that you don't just relate to uh and what we experienced was here are women who are our friends here are women who um who are so every day who are funny who are witty who are intelligent who have their hearts broken uh how do we tell their story to the world and and and, and i'm so right like every time you i mean there is no way you can make a feature doc in india unless you come from wealth so you have to go out and 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 look for funds and every time the questions are what's your narrative arc what's your three act structure who is your key character what's your plot point what is your climax and i'm just like i don't know what my climax is going to be because i've started filming this story and i don't know what this journey is going to evolve and end up to be so so you know so so we were very clear that you know long story cut short that this has to be told inside out this has to be meera's story sunita's story sham kali's story and each of these three very peculiar characters were in three very different stages of their own sort of marital lives so to speak uh, as mothers as daughters as you know wives uh, and also as journalists at three very different stages within the system so we were looking at the systemic shifts that they were make, making within their homes within their institutions and in and in their society and how do you stitch all of that together to tell a story that's cohesive powerful and for us most importantly uplifting because the women at khabar leheria sort of they have this energy that sort of gives you hope in the times that we live in you know we we live in a time where you denied your grace of rage but i think that the work that khabar leheria is doing actually is a way of sort of telling you more than you know uh it it's difficult to articulate this but but when i was with those women i would find my silver lining of hope for what i feel my country should be and could be and 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 imagining a democracy the the, the way they were imagining we were like literally like on on the same page so it was in that sense very easy to uh tell their story for us I don't know if I answered your question, Vedat. No, you did. <laughs> you did. And grace of rage is such a beautiful term, Sushma. If you see me using it in my articles, I I'll try and acknowledging you. Uh, I'll try and acknowledge you. But and um, that also so so aptly describes your film and the women in your film, the grace of rage. So um, anyway, going back to the question for people who may have just joined, the question is when you're filming something that's ongoing, especially a movement. when do you know how to stop when do you know that your film is done i stopped because of the pandemic <laughs> so that was a very it's like yeah go home girl um i with 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 this thing done like i knew i want to talk a bit about showgirls of pakistan because it took 7 years we finished filming in 2015 and we released the film last year so it was a long edit process and 
part of it was again grappling with what we had. So we stopped filming at a point where we're like, okay, we we see movement in the lives of all these people that we've been filming, but then how to tell a story that is that was not based in victimhood, fighting with the industry for funding, moving back from it and being like, okay, this is how we're this is no, this is not what we want to do. Like let's let's come back to what our intention was. So what Tuba said about like your your basic principles, I think it's intention setting for filmmakers as well. Or uh Vintu and Sushmit saying it's about, you know, we look for stories for hope. That that's your, I think your intention going into a project has to be clear and then the story and plot may manifest itself. Um, and so after like seven years of like of intention setting and, and, and really grappling with how to do this representation in a film when we're constantly told to put in all those sort of Western linear character must have an arc, must be, you know, there must be a climax and a, and a solid ending, fighting against that and going back to know that characters can tend to tell their own story in their own way. Uh, then with, and we were able to do that because of lifting the wheel a little bit about the process because we made it independently. We didn't have funders who we had who had to approve an edit. Uh, same with this thing, Dawn, I've been lucky that way. I have had Canada Arts Council funding, which is again, it's like, you're an artist, do whatever you want. So after seven years of fighting, I was like, okay, this is great. I'm gonna make a film, which is gonna be a countdown. The, the, the third act will start with the march and then we'll move to, um, the backlash after the march because in, I, and I knew exactly what was going to happen in my head because I I've done in a sense two years of research because I was organizing with with the women in 2018 in Karachi in 2019 in Islamabad with Tuba so I was like I know what this is like I've lived through this and so I think making a film about your own experience you're you're kind of like huh but that but then the pandemic happens and you're like okay not, nothing's going to happen after the march because everybody's moved on surprisingly to other things but again like you know including the the protest that Tuba spoke about it was a lot about again what is what what, what is what am I trying to say with this film um and it's not it's not just a story about the march it's a story about organizing and who am I saying it to and what do they need to hear I think that's really important um and then and then it, it just makes your choices really easy about when to stop or when to film more or when to put your camera down Yeah, and you know, and I'm seeing somebody in the audience ask this question as well. And so, you know, I'll, I'll just mash it into my question. My next question is when you're making these films for a global audience, there is, a, you know, there is a kind of documentary filmmaking in India which makes it very easy for people in the West to understand. There's so many footnotes. And uh, they just like, there's so much of simplification that you almost end up doing a disservice to the people in your film and to the land where it's originating from because you completely kind of like, it's like plucking a chicken. It's like, you know, you've kind of like done away with everything that is nuanced and complex about the story. And then now this is like the most simplistic way of telling a story which neither of these films do. So, you know, one question that came up from the audience and we'll get to the rest later is, do you think about the audience when you're making the film? So, and you know, part two of that question is how much of dumbing down do you think you're able to do for a global audience who might not be, you know, Immediately, I mean, of course, protest and protest culture, grassroots journalism, it's they are kind of global subjects. But, you know, the way you guys have made your film is very situated in its uh, in its it's very situated in its uh, place of history and geography. So how did you think of an audience when you were making the film? And did you think of a global audience when thinking the film, thinking of the film? And while you guys think about it, Tuba, what I can ask you is, as a participant within the film, were you worried that what you're saying will be lost in a global context when these when the film travels festivals? To be honest, I was more worried about the local audience <laughs> than the global audience. Uh, for me, I was like, okay, so um, I remember, and it's not part of the film, but Anam came and she was shooting at my house um, and she was shooting my dressing table. 
and I was just like, Anu, don't. I was thinking, Anu, why are you shooting my makeup? <laughs> and I'm just thinking this in my head. And of course, like, you know, you're concerned because as an organizer, uh, there, there are so many parts of you that you almost have to curate, especially if, if you're visible, um, that it, it becomes very difficult to be yourself, um, especially in front of, you know, in front of the camera. Um, so I, I do think, yes, I was, but I was personally more worried about the local audience than the global. I think I didn't even think about whether a global audience exists or not, because our concerns were so immediate, so in the moment, in that context, because the backlash, um, and after An Anim's film finished, I think the backlash actually got much worse. We actually had blasphemy cases on us. Uh, which were on the organizers saying that uh, we've gone against religion and we've insulted Islam and um, and perhaps like ruined the culture also, but you know, did a lot of devious stuff. Um, so I think for me, the concern was definitely about the local audience. But yeah, um, just like I think they, they just mentioned it right now, and I, not particularly with this term, or gen but generally. It's always a concern because I think there's a certain way the, the I would say the global West at least uh, looks at women from you know countries like ours, and that's always a struggle because um, they they either want us to look like that I am a unique character in my country, and there are no other women like me, or they just want to show how miserable everything is. So I think that that balance for me as an organizer or whenever I'm speaking to media, especially like, you know, uh, English media, it's just so difficult to maintain because you don't know, you don't want them to carry, you know, a caricature be na apka bana de ke you're just some amazing person and just like this one of a kind of a woman or just like a woman who's living and seeing so much pain around. It's just, I feel like that is so, that, that's something which really bothers me when I'm speaking to are you being represented to a global audience? Because I, I, I would really want a way to make them all understand that it's resistance to oppression is just as normal as the existence of oppression. Wherever there's oppression anywhere in the world, there is resistance. And that is what people's histories across the world has been. And that is what is the history of women like me and the story of women like me from our country. So I think that's that's something I, I definitely struggle with. Anna? Um, I totally forgot what the question was. I uh, was uh, what <laughs> <laughs> no, how do you contextualize for a global? Do you ah, think yes, of the of audience course. when you're making the film? Yeah. Or, or how do you contextualize? So again, like, I feel like, you know, this is my second feature, again, with Showgirls it really opened our eyes, like knocking on doors of the Western industry, being like, yeah, and then being like, you know, where are the victims? <laughs> you know, this is not what we want to see. Like we, and things have changed. So, you know, in 2016, when I was pitching showgirls at Hot Dogs, we got a slew of really weird racist comments, like, you know, which are, which we've spoken about. Uh, and it was, it, it was really heartbreaking. Cause I was like, well, you know, it, these are documentary people they're supposed to be cool they're, they're really not right and especially with Pakistan and Afghanistan this this region their the imagery of victimized Muslim women ha is directly related to, to warfare right and imperialism so I think we have a responsibility as filmmakers to to resist that and to actively speak out against it and actively name it when it's happening um and that was my story with showgirls because that was a film that had to be international for me to like eat <laughs> and you know and, and for us to just be able to release that film at all because where will we show it in Pakistan you know and so you know we we at the end after we'd finished that film after we'd finished it then we spoke to uh we got connected to um a South Asian woman who works at Vice was a producer at Vice, and she sent it to like to, to the the top guy, Saroosh. Yeah, and we and we'd showed that film to white guys who'd worked for for Vice in 2016, and they were like, eh. and it wasn't until brown people saw the film and they're like, oh fuck, this is cool. And then you know, 
the film has a platform and now it's on YouTube and everybody could watch and that's exactly what we wanted. We made the film for Pakistan. We made it for a Pakistani audience. It has so much context and so much like masala that only we would get. And, and I think part of the reason why like Vice was the only and Sarush was the only option for us for the market was because there's, we don't really bother with context. It was like, like, what do you need? Like human beings are the same. We all know what being in an industry related to sexuality is for women in any country. It's not like black women in America are respected <laughs> if they're dancing on a pole or whatever. And it's the same for working class women in Pakistan. And so, yeah, so with the stained on also, I, I started filming without any support. So I knew it was for a Pakistani audience. The funny thing is that, again, with, with Showgirls, we had initially intended it for a global audience. And with this, I intended it to be for us. Like, this is something I'm doing for us, us meaning me and the women I knew. And as Tuba said, now, like, I can't screen it here. So, which is fine. But then I'm like, okay, this is a time capsule. This is something, this is, this is a moment of archiving. And eventually, of course, we'll be, we'll, when this blows over, because everything is cyclical, and we all, you know, there'll be something else for, for the uh, right wing to, to run off against. And I, you know, and then we can screen it here. But, but yeah, and I think more, the more decision makers in the industry are not the old guard, the more room we have to make these films. I mean, a few years ago, just us directing and producing our own stories was not happening, right? So at least we're, you know, we're at the big festivals, we're getting the grants, uh, we're, we're being seen as serious filmmakers. And like, literally that was not the case in maybe 2015. When some white girl is getting the money to make a film about a, a girl in Pakistan playing football. Wow, she's from a rich family, I know. Like, what are you trying to, like, what are you trying to, you know, it's so stupid. So. So I think those of us who have been around and seeing how the market works and how the, because it's a market, it's an industry, it, uh, it's and it's an art, uh, that audience is very much a part of how we make the film. So Shmetran too. I think for me, it's, it's, I see it as a three part process. The first one is is the making of it, where it's just us. And 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 most stories, like Anam said so eloquently, are unique and universal. You know, the human, it might be a very particular moment in a particular region in the world, but the human experience is universal. So that aspect I'm very confident about. Um, and 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 yeah, you know, I hold on to that. And then the second part of it is the pitching of it, which is where you need to uh, uh, brace yourself for all kinds of of uh, um, questions. And I remember once we were pitching, and the person across the table got so excited, and she said, "This is going to be the next India's daughter." And we were mortified, and we said. This is not going to be, this is going to be quite the opposite. So you have to deal with a lot of what exists out there and how your representation is going to be different. And because there is very little frame of reference for it, people really don't want to grasp that by the merit of your word, because again, people have not seen brown producers and directors. Um, and, and so they always want a frame of reference. And that's where we were, we learned to put, put our vision up front and say, this is, this is about women who are already empowered. empower We are not becoming their voice. We are amplifying their voice. And in this way is what the story is going to be. And we feel that that story would resonate. And then the third aspect of it is the editing of it, which where everything comes together. And we really wanted to keep the sanctity of the edit room really just very protected, which is why we wanted to be the producers through and through. Jaha editorial right is entirely ours. And we can, that's when I think we were most conscious of the audience, mm -hmm. where we didn't want to simplify something as complex as the caste system. How do you do that in 90 minutes? And you, we didn't want to overcomplicate it for the for the home audience. And that striking of that balance was was very hard. I'm thinking about every film that we've made, and and we we 
the initial decision we make is isme kuch text karne hona let's see if that can exist on its own and when you watch the drafts and you share it with people you realize there is a information uh, you know there are things that are not tying together and then you start putting one card and say okay does this work and then the language of it um and and that's how the first opening title card for writing with fire after drafts and drafts and drafts and and you were a part of that process they that three just to arrive at the exact uh, nuance of that language where which which people uh, would get and i really believe that a lot of it cannot be explained and a lot of hollywood that i watch i don't understand like there is zero context and yet you just like you like okay let's get on with it this guy that woman you know you just understand because you don't really need to understand everything and it's really about making peace with the fact that ye to nahi samajh aayega and it's okay this is for my home audience to get uh, and 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 i'm okay with that and the rest of it um the 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 global audience going to get because a lot of reviews that we got in the beginning was the only nooks people found was explain nahi kiya ki ye 15 saal pehle kaise khabar le rahi came into being and there was such a thing you know an, an important decision that we made and eventually we came to the fact that agar scene mein apne aap ho jata hai where a scene is playing out and it and the history of it comes out great otherwise people will google it because we are entering the story where where it's a definitive mo- moment where that cusp is happening of print to digital and and you figure out why this institution is why it is and and why what the makeup of it is if you're really keen on understanding the the etymology of origins then you will find a way to find that out and i'm okay keeping that out of the film so i think a lot of it is also like push and pull within yourself because you want to make a film that's like super accessible and easy to pitch but uh, negotiation with oneself happens no and as a uh, as a journalist who writes on documentaries i think i really appreciate when a filmmaker trusts the journalist to do their homework and sadly not all journalists like that but i think I think you're right uh, Rindu and Anam that there has to be something that I go back home and read up on like you know otherwise like this is not this is not school this is not where you tell me this is a problem and this way you solve it this is this is what you do it's not supposed to be and like you know I'm I'm really happy that both these films come out of that that this is the def- let me tell you what's happening in the small town in rural western india or you know whatever that gaze is i'm so happy that you both your films are not catering to that and and you know like you said that in the in the beginning there are there is lazy journalism but eventually i think people do come around to reading up uh, before before or after watching a film i will get on to the audience questions a uh, question for everyone often protest organizing and dissent are covert acts especially in countries like ours how do you negotiate the dilemma of what is made visible and what's not and you guys like you can interject unmute yourself shout at each other whatever you want to do you know something i i i learned from like all these master puppeteers who are leading these authoritarian regimes is the fact that perception is everything truth is not so you can find ways in telling your story without making very direct references to what is happening and yet give the audience uh how do i put it you respect the audience's intelligence to be able to absorb what 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 you're trying to do and what your characters are trying to do and i think that um as as it becomes more and more difficult uh um, to be to to be artists to be writers to be historians uh i think people will find more creative uh ways in 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 framing these stories uh, the and and you'll see like the language of of documentary cinema especially in spaces where there is a lot of repression changes and and weirdly and for instance there's some fantastic films that have come out of china and they've just come out like you know they've not been censored kuch kisi ko samajh bhi nahi aaya ki ye kya hai but jinko samajh tha they're like are wah like ye film bana di like what 
what an act of protest. But, you know, the censor board there was just like, this is great, pass, watch the film. Which, so, you know, so the, the, the language that is used in telling this story is constantly going to keep refined and reworked. And, you know, that's, that's the job of an artist, I suppose. I think one of the reasons why um, in, in such, you know, um, such, yeah, in, in pure dunya mein aisa hota hai ki, like, usually it is always the painter, the singer, the musician um, who will be jailed. Uh, and and, and because, because it's easy to fight a bullet with a bullet. But you can't fight ideas. Uh, you can't fight dreams. And those are things that we play in. And that's why we are so dangerous. I mean, I think that is essentially what makes, makes this clique of folks so dangerous. And I think that's essentially why uh, systems of repression are so scared of us. Uh, so I think, I think this is such a ripe time. And, and people talk about, I mean, there's a lot of cynicism in the world. But, but as Anam said, like, you know, in the last five years, six years, the conversations changed. Now more colored people are telling their own stories, uh, and 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 that is leading to sort of like this wave of change in terms. And it will take time, but at least it's happening. Like you know, when we were in film school, we saw these like documentaries about Calcutta, which is essentially poverty porn, uh, and you would rage going, "Ye kya hai? Hum ye kyu dekh rahe? This, this is not the Calcutta and the memory of like a city that I have cherished and I've grown up to know. Some white man comes in funded by like, you know, the French cultural center uh, and shoots this and takes it out to the world. And that's valid. But my vision and my story is not valid. So, you know, that raging against the system has also started as more folks such as us have, have been given. And I don't think we've been given, actually, we've just taken it. Like, you know, that's also another way of looking at it. We've actually taken it. And so, now when you said that, you know, at uh, Hot Dogs, when you were pitching in 2016, incidentally, you know, we were at Hot Dogs this year, virtually. Uh, they'd invited us as, as observers. And there was this uh, commissioning editor who got called out for something that he said. And we were just like, you know, it's just change. Like, we're, we're going through such a different time right now. And that is something that, invests so much hope into you know the process of storytelling for all of us uh so yeah i think jab tak resistance jab, jab tak aisa rahega, resistance rahega, or, and we're all products of that and we'll find our ways to take our stories out to the world and um to remind you the question was when i remember, you... I remember. okay okay <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to uh, Sushmis and Mintu separately about who that was and what was said because I love I love. Oh, I want to be on that. I yeah, be spill on the that tea project. later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in the international context, yeah, it's it's like uh, I was in a, a session, a pandemic era, man. Somebody says we we need to call ourselves the people of the global majority now and not POC or like uh, global south or whatever. And I love that because it is it's really like it contextualizes who we are and and what this audience is and what these stories who these uh, stories represent and it gives you power and i think yeah this is a time where sabki thodi si phati hai nobody wants to be cancelled nobody wants to be you know uh called out for anything so you can just you can assert your power um and fake it till you make it even if you don't have power that's my mo and then for like the local audience i think there is some um, like yeah, I don't. I know India. I mean, there's been films that have had theatrical releases, and you have Netflix India and and Vice India. Like there's more opportunities for a local audience. But in Pakistan, we don't have, you know, my film industry. We could sell belly the bar revive we um, and even now, like most of the most film production, like post pandemic, is now being uh, financed by the intelligence services. Um, most new multiplexes that have been built in the last few years are financed by the intelligence services. So really, it's just like mm, there's 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 you know most of the young talent right now are is indie, indie talent is in fiction world is making shows for for Z, uh, you know. So. Um, there is some advantage when we think about audience and and safety if if that that's how i understood the question uh for when when filming when our when we turn on ca our camera to these to these movements in knowing that kids 
I personally try to avoid local press that much because I know I, I am I'm one of the founders of the Documentary Association of Pakistan. And one of the things that we do is find films that have been made and screen them, but we don't we know we're not going to go to a broadcaster. We're not going to go to like the arts council, government funded theater. We go to safe community spaces. We go to universities where we know the professors are safe. Um, you know, they're they're not going to go to the admin and get it censored or bagwasuigi. So you know, right now I can't show the stained on, but in a year or two, when that becomes more possible, I know that my network network is going to be smaller communities. And Mahabi, it's not like we're only preaching to the converted because we are constantly, especially through DAP, we're always looking to find new spaces and new cities. But at least, more interaction per person to person or jati. It was anonymity khatam jati, and there's more room for discussion and dialogue you know and I'm, even in these spaces i really you know my my intention is also that there's people are meeting communities communities are being expanded and people get to like really get involved in like kya hai, not just your film here your propaganda because as a documentarian here like i i really don't like telling people randomly what i do because right away i'm a, I'm, I'm a suspicious person right um, that's just the way we're viewed uh, in the region, I think, because especially Pakistan, I think that it's Shermin Abedgar and Oscar because of acid throwing Willie film. So it's just the name of Pakistan and our culture in our culture. That's the number one thing, right? Reputation. So, so yeah, so I think operating in the margins and knowing that you will have always a small audience, it's sad and sometimes as an artist because you're putting so much labor in your work. But you also like, I think for me, especially after watching people organize to the Earth March, I think I really see value in smaller scale resistance, right? Resistance that is closer to your home and audiences that like change the mind of 50 people, not necessarily 50,000. And that's valuable enough for your film. Thank you. Um, so this is the last question I'll take. And I think the others we've touched upon, if not in their entirety, we've touched upon points of them. Uh, so Tuba, the question is, give me a second, let me scroll up. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's mostly a question of documentary and its history of being extractive. So how do you negotiate the power imbalance when working on such topics? So Tuba, if I can start with you, because you are a protagonist in the story, dealing with a documentary filmmaker, uh, what was your experience like with uh, Anam's film? Are you still there? Okay, yeah, uh, Anam's film. And also, you know, I'm sure you set out setting some boundaries. And with Anam, of course, like, you know, she's a comrade, you've, you've been in touch, but like, you know, when you think of a filmmaking crew coming and making a film about you and your activism, what are the boundaries you set uh, in terms of, you know, just, just not to be extracted from? And then I'll get to the filmmakers and maybe then call it a day. I mean, I've, I've actually been shot by different uh, people from different countries. Um, and I remember somebody who was working with this film company in Hong Kong came to shoot me. And for some reason, they, they really wanted me to talk about um, my personal life. Um, and and they, they were just asking really personal questions, um, which, which made me feel like I was being surveilled. <laughs> I think there's always this fine balance with, between storytelling and providing emanation for sur surveillance or actively surveilling, right? So I think that, and this, this I've felt with certain people um, and I haven't felt this so much from people from my own country um, or, you know, people like Anam or people I otherwise also know, but this often happens that they, they ask you, sometimes you're asked questions which you're not even comfortable confronting yourself um, or, or especially when they, I mean, we, we face a lot of different kinds of dangers and threats. Um, and sometimes when we're even asked to talk about those threats, um, it actually puts you in more threat when you're going to tell about, okay, what kind of threats do you have? How many times your hogs was shot at? Um, you know, how many threatening calls did you get this month? Um, and I, I just feel like that, that's really where, for me, I draw the boundary because for me, I think the primary concern really is, is becomes about the safety of the movement and the people involved in the movement. 
Um, so, you know, not providing ammunition for surveillance or for further danger to people's lives, because I think that's, that's essentially what I've been dealing with for the past few years, uh, with very active, you know, threats my friends receive or the organizers receive. So I, I do feel like that's, that's somewhere I do draw the line. And also in terms of like, who are we speaking to? Because there, there are times when people who work with the state or for the state would approach um, you know, would approach me to speak to them or come to their offices or, you know, give them interviews. So I think that's, that's for me, that's really the only thing I do. And sometimes also uh, when I'm working with the communities, because I work in the slums of Islamabad, um, and just like it was mentioned, so many people are come and speak to me and want to go to me to, you know, film a poverty porn uh, sort of situation. And that's that's where I really... Um, I, I, and that's, that's something which really makes me deeply uncomfortable when people just want to tell stories in a very singular kind of way. Uh, they're poor people, their life is difficult, and that's about it. Even though their lives are complicated, they have experiences, they have children, life, work, community, so much more to it. And I think when people try to tell our stories in a very like, you know, they come with an agenda to you. I think that's, that's what makes me really draw my line. Uh, if I see someone who's come with a set agenda in mind and they're not willing to explore and discover what's really going on um, in the setting, I think, yeah, that's, that's what bothers me. Anna. Yeah, this, I mean, the question of access and power is, is something I think about a lot. Um, Funnily enough, you know, when I was filming Showgirls of Pakistan, I'm filming a community that's not even a community in some sense. It was three different women working in three different spaces. They didn't even know each other. Uh, but the access was very fragile uh, because we were in violent spaces. I mean, there was a lot of times where we were like being like filming actively then and there. We've been escorted out of spaces with like banduke, right? Um, so just at that point you're you're grateful for the access you have and you film whatever you can um and you are obviously given very limited access by your uh, characters as well and in a way that's great because they're really just giving you what they want to give you and I, and, and those are really clear lines and i and i like that i mean it, it's difficult it's very difficult as a filmmaker but at least there is in the situation i was in that sort of almost balanced the power. Um, and in this context, I went into it, you know, because again, seven years of grappling with this film and, and trying to make it as real and authentic to the characters as possible. With this film, I was like, oh, I'm just filming my friends, chilling scene, like, you know, the there is no uh, difference or dynamic. These are my people. But then I realized as I was filming, I had too much power because I had so much trust. And it was like, whoa, like, you know, like, so I had to, there was a lot of, and some, sometimes in the edit, I, there was some parts where I regretted this, but there was times I was editing myself and just putting the camera down because I was like, okay, this is not, again, I had an intention with the film coming into it as well. So there was less of a discovery for me and more of a, this is, I'm in this space as a friend and a filmmaker. And right now I'm going to be a friend. And so, yeah, there was a, it's a, it was a different experience. I, I, I've, I've said this before, I think there's a lot of introspection, introspection we need to do as filmmakers constantly and check ourselves because you do have an idea of what you want and you have that story in mind, but you always have to sort of question yourself about your intentions and if they're still correct and, and, and what this means to people who are on camera. wondering too if you can talk a bit about that and no pressure these are the closing remarks of the conversation i think patience really is going to and and believing that going slow is like forming a relationship um and you're just figuring each other out and and uh once the access is new and it's not like a transactional thing okay access okay this person's okay it's really about conversations my presence in their space um their space accepting us um as as people who don't share their reality but 
they're comfortable to open up their lives and their families and be in a space of vulnerability with us around the con kind of the quality of conversations that we all are having how much of our own life are we open to sharing um and and that is a is a very intrinsic part of how much does that does my protagonist know about me um and and then i think again intuitively you figure out there are there are things that people are not going to be comfortable talking about or presenting uh, about their their lives and you just respect that because with time that door will open if they want it to open and if you want to go there it's it's really with time even with the shots where we've taken like a few months to make just a shot we've always been like this is what been very clear about our intentions this is the film that we would like to make but it's a process of discovery um and we have to get there together and with writing with fire i remember there were a few questions that that, that we wanted to explore we didn't till the fifth year which we wanted like right from the beginning because the moment wasn't right and when it happened it just happened and and it's a gorgeous scene in the film so it's really about and sometimes you don't and it's okay um because you go into a story with a lot of questions um and 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 it's okay to not find those answers for the screen you might be a richer person because you got them and and it's 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 totally fine and that's the negotiation until the very end it does not begin and end with the the consent form that they have signed it's a con going process of them understanding what this is and you, yet maintaining the sanctity of this is my story this is how i look at your life and and editorially this is this is this is going to be like you know how i look at your life but um just seeing which door and windows opening where i remember sunita wasn't 100% on board in the beginning um she was like okay you can interview me you can do come with me when we are we are going reporting but not in my house and we said okay that's totally fine um it was disappointing but we said like okay fine and then for the first year we shot extensively with meera and shamkali and by the end of it sunita was like do you guys want to go come have dinner at my place and that was such a big moment for us because then it just opened and and uh, we stayed at her place and out of those emerged like some really powerful moments in the film uh, so it's a constant i would say till the very end it's a constant act of negotiation this thing called access thank you so much i mean i could i didn't even look at the watch but it's it's we are way over time this has been such an amazing conversation and a great start to my day we're only starting our tuesdays here in new york so thank you so much anam sushmit rintu and i think tuba had to jump off because of some internet issues uh, thank you deepthi radha and dhamshala international film festival for having us thank, thank you thanks for that thank you thank you